Hi, I'm Mali. I'm a social entrepreneur and an environmental lawyer. My passion is about housing and sustainability. Looking at on the panel today so far, none of you come out of with the idea of tackling energy poverty, which as a social entrepreneur, I have a huge problem when you go door to door trying to get people on board and understanding. And I'm a huge promoter of sunlight, which is solar panels, biomass, and lots more than rather than relying on energy tycoons. So I'm just wondering where you're going to go with your new build local authority plan and having a comprehensive plan about it. Okay. Does new build uh, offer a new opportunity around solar generated energy? Is that part of the solution that new homes can do other things too? Other people? Cameron Brown from WSP Group. I'm just wondering about the relative um, strengths and weaknesses of um, focusing on new builds versus the stock that we've already got and, and particularly to Brendan um, what your organisation's focus is because you've got tens of thousands of existing dwellings, and I'm just wondering, are you planning on building tens of thousands of more, or is there something that you can do with the existing stock? It's been said that, um, that one of the inhibitions in the overall supply in London is, is the speed at which, I suppose, the, the, the market is prepared, or, or developers and, and maybe all developing organisations are prepared to take a risk around sales and the absorption rates that, um, that, that the current supply, suppliers of housing are prepared to accept. Does the panel accept that and is there a way of increasing those, those sales rates then to generate more supply? Do you mean that there might be a case that uh, people producing housing aren't committed to maximising the number of houses available for sale? It might be in their business interests or their, their yeah. commercial interests to do just that. Okay, so it would be very interesting to have a comment about that. Question around, um, do you think are sort of the main sort of issues or challenges in regarding to, with the differences with uh, inner and outer London like from that earlier source? diagram that kind of shows the not so much being done in the outer London sort of area about what could be done to possibly unlock those sort of areas. Particularly uh, targeted to Matt but uh, I'd welcome views from others. Um, sitting in the Guildhall this whole concept of uh, social sustainability and value therewith is very compelling but I'm just trying to transfer myself to the boardroom of Barclay and the boardroom of Barclay's supply chain. Uh, just to find out how they can satisfy themselves that it's also economically sustainable. Okay, can socially sustainable also be economically sustainable? Great, let's pick up those. Oh, okay, sir, you can come in, yep. There's been no mention on space standards so far. It's interesting to note that where permitted developments have happened to create uh, housing and form offices, space standards are get down to near half the size. Uh, they sell like hotcakes, doesn't mean low quality. Should we, that's a way of actually making them more affordable and getting twice as many houses in the same size. Should we not look at eliminating space standards? Why don't you take two questions each? Why don't we start, uh, if we may, with you, Mike, then we'll go to Brendan and Matt, and then we'll ask Natalie to reflect and to close the session. Okay, I think they're all great questions. I, I know, but only pick two. Um, the two I'm going to pick is the, uh, to answer the gentleman about um, suburban London and unlocking suburban London. Uh, we're really pleased now that we're working heavily in suburban London. And where we're working is where, as Natalie would say, there is already leadership. Leadership with a chief exec and a, a, a leader who have often been working together for quite some time uh, with an ambition to get things done and some learning. So Enfield, for instance, has eight years of learning behind it. They've moved from a small sites program through steering their own regeneration programs to being now on the cusp of a, a three and a half to 8,000 home uh, major regeneration project at Meridian Water. Um, you know, it's been remarkable to work with them over that period of time. And I'm sure Natalie would pick up on this, uh, that actually the learning that they have embedded in their organisation should be something that can be transferred to others to shortcut the learning experience. Um, I'm juggling, I think I'm going to talk to the space standards question because it comes up all the time. Um, 
We need everything, actually. We need all kinds of housing, and it has to be appropriate to the needs of the local market. And we work with Pocket. They provide, we design for them, and they build beautiful homes which are affordable to a local income. And I think that linkage with income is a key determinant on affordability, and I think they have a model that's extremely interesting. But I'll take the first two as one, if I don't yeah. mind. Well, that's cheeky. It is. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> the sustainability issue, the energy issue, the problem isn't new build. The, the, actually, you know, we've got the stuff that we're building is actually too energy efficient <laughs> at times, and overheating is one of the big challenges that we've got going forward, not, not actually heating itself. Mm. Where the issue is, is in existing stock. And the gains for London and the UK is in the energy performance of existing homes. So that's where our challenge is. So on the second question, what is it about our existing stock? Well, the first thing is, is energy efficiency and, and cost in use for our residents. At Family Mosaic, we own between 10 and 15,000 street properties in, all, all throughout London, Edwardian Victorian homes. Fantastic, very desirable, but very hard to heat. We've got very big challenges uh, with them. The other issue on stock for us is, and this is the big issue I think uh, that we're not tapping into, is the under-occupation and the older people living mm. in large homes mm. which are really needed for families. Mm. And we need carrots, which is good quality older person's housing provided, mm. and we need sticks of the tax system mm. working to encourage people to do it to encourage people to move out and release family units for families. Mm. It's a, a big issue for us. So if that's one, and the sales risk one, Jamie, which is a tough one, what's really interesting is a housing association and a developer, mm. what, what governs the amount of development we do is the maximum sales risk we can be exposed to. Mm. Not our surpluses, Natalie, but, but the, the sales risk. So at Family Mosaic, we're exposed, it's small in your terms, Matt, 400 million worth of sales in one snapshot. So if the market collapsed tomorrow, I have to know how to cope with that without damaging my existing tenant base. Mm. And so it, the, the sales risk is the big thing. And I actually think the way we can do more is a debate with government about how we manage that risk. Mm. Rather than grant, it's how do we manage that risk so when the downturn comes, we can carry on developing it through it because housing associations used to be counter-cyclical. Mm. We used to be able to pick up um, all the developments when the market turned down. We're now cyclical because we're dependent upon sales income. And actually, we need to work out a way to keep the market going and when, the, when the market turns down. Matt? I'll two. pick up on the same question and then, because it's an important tricky one, I guess it was aimed at me, not Brendan, no, probably. Yeah. I think it's habit, not strategy, if I can put it like that. So there's an experience which says, actually, out of any sales suite, you can probably sell about 250 a year with confidence. And the old, uh, the old hacks will say, I know that. And every year for the last 20 years, that's been true, come hell or high water. So arguing against that, you'd need to have quite a compelling case or just be quite ballsy. Um, now, maybe we could sell a bit more. Maybe we could take a bit more sales risk. It would depend on increasing the number of outlets, not more from the same single outlet. Hmm. So um, that's... Um, uh, that's probably where we are on that one, but there isn't, no, there isn't a, a deliberate strategy of undersupply, mm. um, whatever the Guardian might think. <laughs> um, in terms of the, the board conversation about social sustainability, it's not been a difficult sell. I put this, I parody it slightly, but what's interesting, typically a local authority would come to us and go, look, we need a community, can we have a community hall? Mm. And trying to unpick that and say, that's not how you build community, has been part of the discussion. And in particularly where I do think we get mileage, I certainly get internally, is to help people understand that the issue is, is revenue, not capital funding. So the thing that we need to create better places in London is revenue funding, not more buildings, which then become a liability. Mm. So the park is gone, the youth work is gone. When it was SRB funding, developers always used to have somebody who was really good at community development. That, all that skill base evaporated during the early noughties. What we're trying to do is drag some of it back in. My background's in the voluntary sector. Um, trying to get some of that kind of insight into how you do social sustainability and combine the beauty of the architecture with creating a fantastic community for people of all tenures. That's the thing we're trying to learn. And it's often, um, it's not an expensive 
thing. It's about your skill. It's about the desire to do it. And once you can measure it, of course, as a board, you then have a really interesting set of KPIs. So I can measure people's quality of life in different Barclay developments, and that sure as hell sets the cat amongst the pigeons. Really interesting. You've got a really interesting way of saying, well, if you think you're all about place, let's see and let's compare and let's see where we could do it even better. Mm. So it's, um, it's not been a money debate. Mm. Matt, thank you very much indeed. Natalie, can you respond to the questions and also wrap up the conversation? Thank you. Um, really good questions. Um, I'm just going to just follow up on this, this last question on social sustainability, and I think really looking at the economic case around it. One of the reasons that a number of big businesses are looking at this is because they've had to invest where the cells haven't been so readily available over the last period and turn some of their own capital uh, programs and expenditure into long-term revenue. And to do those in partnership with a number of other organizations like local authorities and others. And what do I mean by that? I mean that instead of a, a, a you know, build quick and sell model, instead now there's very much an investment hold model. And we know from regeneration that you really do drive value if you create place and you hold a sense of place. And so for people who have got perhaps land that they've put into investments that are holding equity, people who are looking at an investment uh, portfolio, they want to know that this development is going to be sustainable from a social and therefore an economic basis for the longer term. So I think this, this concept is, is one that's very much part of the economic case as well as a, obviously a good thing to do. Um, it very much links to this issue of speed of market. So they're the two that I'm just going to link in my final comments. Um, we saw some very good examples of local authorities stepping in to help during the, the worst of the recession after the credit crunch. And an example that, that came to mind with that question was a council who provided a sales guarantee to a developer on a stalled site. And what they said is, you build them, and if you can't sell them, we'll take them at this fixed price. Builder went ahead, guarantee was never called, the site was built out. And that was replicated in a number of other sites. So I think that was a really good example of, of an authority thinking creatively how to move forward and encourage that supply. The reason we need to really expand, and that is the, the focus of the work that we are looking at with, the, uh, with, with HFI, but the, the reason that we really need to expand the number of participants in the market are because of some of these, these kind of very sensible business comments that you've heard today. Uh, businesses do have a risk appetite, businesses do have a development appetite, but actually beyond established businesses, there are so many more players who want to come and do more. There are so many participants with different hats who want to come in and do a bit more. And I think it's really, really important, given the scale of the housing need that we have, that we find ways to ensure that all participants can come to the market, can engage, can deliver, so that we can really make sure that we meet that housing challenge and start delivering the homes that we need. So thank you.